This episode is brought to you by Michelob Ultra, the official beer sponsor of the NBA, who's getting you closer to the game than ever with exclusive prizes. Enter for your chance to win at MichelobUltra.com slash courtside. Enjoy responsibly. 2024 Anheuser-Busch Michelob Ultra Light Beer, St. Louis, Missouri. Michelob Ultra registered courtside sweepstakes. No purchase necessary. Open to U.S. residents 21 and up. Begins October 19th, 2023 and ends June 12th, 2024. Multiple entry periods. See official rules at MichelobUltra.com slash rules for free entry, entry deadlines, prices, and details. Message and data rates may apply. Void where prohibited. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Orange and Brown Talk podcast on a Wednesday. Dan Lobby, Mary Kay Cabot, Ashley Bastock. Uh, we are going to give you a little bit of a shorter pod here. We're squeezing squeezing it in today. We got a meeting. We got combine planning, all this stuff. So uh, just putting it out there. But Mary Kay, you had a, an, an interesting idea, and it was something you wrote for your uh, newsletter that went to our Football Insider subscribers on Wednesday morning. If you want to get that newsletter, it's cleveland.com slash Browns, the blue banner at the top of the page. Um, We're in silly season, right? This is the time of year when things get thrown out there and there's a lot of speculation. And I, I mean, look, I'm doing a series of posts, picking one player from every team that the Browns should pursue in free agency. And there's going to be some real unrealistic names on there, whether they're big names, small names, whatever. But it's just sort of what we do this time of year in the NFL. How much, I mean, let's just start here. How much of kind of what people are saying about the Browns, the things people are throwing out there about the Browns right now, how much of that do you think is just kind of, hey, this is a 24-7 news content business. We've we've got to create posts. We've got to have stories. We've, we've got to do this stuff. How much of some of what we see this time of year do you think is just a result of that? I think a fair amount of it is a result of that. When I look at what Mike Tannenbaum threw out there on ESPN, that the Browns should trade Deshaun Watson and a second round pick to the Giants for Daniel Jones. To me, that's let's get some content going today on ESPN. Things are flagging a bit. Uh, Let's ratchet it up and see what we can't going. And it worked perfectly. I mean, it was all anybody was talking about that day. We, we all saw it all over the internet, but I mean, there's no way that that would happen. Uh, That wasn't born out of any inside Intel. It was an idea, a thought that he had. And then, you know, Dan Graziano who also works for ESPN, chimed in and said the Browns would do that in a heartbeat, which, of course, that piqued my attention, perked my ears up because I'm thinking, wait a minute, like, do you know something? (laughs) Um, You know, the way that he said that so definitively, you know, I'm thinking, what, is somebody telling you they they wouldn't mind? But anyways, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's, It's silly season. That's not happening. That was never going to happen. And in terms of the things that have gone on like that this particular week, that just goes into the category of this is ridiculous. I think there's certain things too, Ashley, like people need to understand the business a little bit. Like there's certain things on a national level that are going to move the needle. Uh, I mean, there's a reason that the Dallas Cowboys get so many national TV games and people talk about the Dallas Cowboys on these national shows all the time, right? The LA Lakers. I mean, there are things that move the needle. And frankly, if you're just going to throw something out there, Deshaun Watson moves the needle. We know Browns fans take the bait on everything. I mean, if you think they don't know that at ESPN, I don't I don't know what to tell you. Browns fans, if you say anything, Browns fans are going to take the bait. Um, it's just a perfect storm. So you throw out and there's nothing wrong with throwing out speculative trades. It's been going on for years. It's basically what all NBA media is now. So like in the NFL, we're starting to see it too, but you have to sort of understand what it is as well. So when Mike Tannenbaum throws that out, he's not saying like, Hey, the Browns have been talking to the giants about this trade. Um, It wasn't exactly a very well thought out proposal anyway, but that's just sort of where we're at in the calendar. Yeah. I mean, this just feels like that prime sort of time for this stuff to happen. And I do think like, this is my, third full off season covering an NFL team right now. It feels like even like me, like I'm kind of getting the hang of the routine of when things pop up. And it it feels like 
when these trades start to actually materialize, I just wrote, like, included a line about this in my newsletter. It's, like, right before that free agency window opens, right? Like, think about that first week of March. We were just talking about that upcoming week. Like, that's when the Amari Cooper deal materializes, right? That's kind of, like, my model in terms of thinking because teams are getting ahead of the curve before free agency really gets going, Um, So, yeah, it's like this time in February where it's like, you know, right before the Super Bowl, right after the Super Bowl. NFL fans care about the NFL all the time. It doesn't stop just because the NFL calendar is slowed down. So to me, it's like when you hear these, you know, far fetched ideas at this time of year in this month, that's just exactly what they are. I mean, I even floated a couple in my GM for a day post when because like we don't know who these trade targets are going to be yet. Right. Like. And you can look at, okay, who are some guys across the league that might move? And if I want the Browns to trade their second round pick, sure, offer it to the Eagles for Hassan Reddick. But that doesn't mean in any world that that's going to happen. So I think that's just what everyone is doing right now. And those trades aren't going to materialize for a couple more weeks, really, in my mind. I think some of it, too, gets ratcheted up in social media because, I mean, let's be honest, you've got a lot of influencers out there. And they'll just kind of throw things out there and people will take that as gospel too. So I I think there's a lot of that too, Mary Kay, like with social media and the way people consume things and, you know, sometimes people just looking for retweets, some people just having fun and messing around. I mean, we see with athletes all the time, they know they throw out an eyeball emoji, it's going to go nuts. So like, I I think that's a piece of this too. It it just all kind of stacks on top of it itself, I guess. Yeah, and then you factor in uh, the Deshaun Watson name, and it brings up a whole new dynamic, right? I mean, you know that you can get people riled up about Deshaun Watson, and you know that the national media in particular, uh, you know, they're just, they're not, they're not budging on, on Deshaun Watson. Nobody's ready to say Deshaun's going to be good. Nobody's ready to say this trade is going to amount to anything. And it moves the needle to talk about that. Um, And then of course the giants are a a big New York market. So, you know, you're just going to throw gas on that fire there. Um, So I think that has a lot to do with it, that I think Deshaun in a lot of ways, uh, you know, is a a target for this sort of thing uh, just because of the baggage and uh, because of the history that he brings to it. And I think that that is going to follow him throughout his career. So I do, I do agree with Mary Kay that when Dan Graziano said that little nugget that the Browns are doing in a heartbeat, that kind of piqued my interest too. Like when Mike Tannenbaum threw that out, it was just, it was what it was. It was a wild trade suggestion, throw it against the wall. I mean, if you really dig in on what it would cost the Browns still to trade Deshaun Watson, you know, obviously you're, you're getting pennies on the dollar for him regardless. I don't even, I honestly would be curious how many teams out there would actually trade for Deshaun Watson right now. I don't think the list is very long. Um, And I don't know that the giants would even be on it, but I just, I don't know. I I understand that part of it. That is what it is. But the Graziano thing, I'm, I'm kind of with Mary Kay on this, Ashley, you do hear that and you're like, wait a second, that's weird. And you could, you could talk yourself into it, right? Because this could, He certainly hasn't lived up to the contract yet. You're starting to wonder if he's ever going to live up to that contract, even if he, you know, does bounce back and play well. Um, And, you know, if you could unload that and save some money, maybe you would. But I don't know that it's something the Browns would actively try to do. I don't know. That was I did think that was a very interesting addition to uh, to what Mike Tannenbaum said. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a very definitive statement from a guy who, you know, tends to break news in his career, right? So I think that was part of what made us all perk up. The It wasn't the initial trade, it was the steadfast agreeing with it by the person who did. But I don't know, maybe this, stuff like this happens and I'm like, maybe I'm just stupid because I'm like, I do not see the benefits of this at all right now. Like, just knowing what Daniel Jones has done. And I do think like part of it is what Mary Kay was getting at from a national perspective, Deshaun Watson has no leeway. And I do think it's going to be like that for a while. And a big part of it is because of the baggage that he came to Cleveland with initially. Um, And I think he's not an easy guy to talk about because of that. I think 
if you're us and you cover the Browns, like we've obviously had to talk about it so many different ways and his suspension and the sexual assault allegations that he's faced. And we also have to cover a football team. So it's a bit different, but I do think like the Browns and Deshaun Watson have been kind of easy to ignore for the most part. And even this year when the Browns were better than 2022, most of the conversation around them was around Miles Garrett or the defense or Joe Flacco after Deshaun got hurt. You didn't see that fervor nationally really pick up until after the midpoint of the season when Deshaun was already out. So I do think he's just an easy guy to ignore for the most part, unless you're throwing in these wild trade scenarios. But when you're as close to the team as we are, I'm like, why would they willing? Like, I don't know, maybe from a money standpoint, but Daniel Jones isn't good. So what are we doing here? It's kind of what I just kept coming back to. Yeah. I mean, Daniel Jones has a bad contract too. It's obviously not Deshaun's, but he doesn't exactly have a, a great contract. I guess, so I've sort of been thinking about this. This isn't really a direction we thought about going, but I I guess I've just been thinking about this as this came out, you know, as that was thrown out there. So the Browns, obviously, we know about the cap situation with Deshaun. They're going to restructure that deal, all of that. But you're looking at $64 million cap hits for the next three years. If you traded him, you'd still be looking at $62 million this year. This is all from over the cap, 44 next year and 26 the year after that. To me, at this point, the contract and the trade, they they are what they are. Like, there's nothing you can do about it. The contract is what it is, and you traded the three first-round picks. What's done is done. Um, I don't know. There is a chance that Deshaun, over the next three years, could live up to that stuff. I I don't know if he will. But the Browns are kind of in a spot, Mary Kay, with Deshaun, where it's like, at the very least, what they just need from him is a, you know, top 10 ish starting quarterback that could win them football games and that they can legitimately legitimately make runs to the Super Bowl. Now you're paying him and you traded for him like a guy who should be a top five quarterback or a top three quarterback. I don't know if he ever gets there, but again, to me, all that's, it is what it is. There's nothing you can do about it. Now the goal is just to get him back to a status off this injury where he's playable. You can win with him. And then anything else after that, if you can get him back to that level, you thought he could be great, but I I don't know. I, I feel like the all that other stuff is done. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't change it. You have to deal with it. Maybe you fix it when the contract is up. But the focus now is just getting Deshaun to be your starting quarterback for 17 games and actually win something with him. Yes, absolutely 100%. And the thing that I keep thinking about with him and when and with this new staff is the fact that it really has to come together very nicely and very quickly, right? I mean, everybody's wiped out. You don't have your offensive coordinator from the previous four years anymore. You don't have your offensive line coach who was uh, instrumental in all these great blocking schemes and wide zone and all that kind of stuff. You know, you, you don't even have your tight ends coach and you don't have your running backs. Everything is new. Everything's new. And I think they're basically going to be reconstructing the offense. Now, I don't necessarily think they're going to reinvent the wheel, but they're going to be reconstructing the offense uh, with a lot of input from Ken Dorsey. Otherwise, they would not have let go of Alex Van Pelt and brought in Ken Dorsey. So they want what he offers in terms of the dual threat quarterback and all the kinds of things that he is well versed in. And again, one of those things is the drop back game and the nuances of the drop back game that um, that that Bill O'Brien ran with the Patriots because Ken Dorsey got that from Brian Dayball, who came from the Patriots. So he's getting the Patriot way. Uh, so that's coming in here in a in a big way. So, you know, you've got all these different elements that are converging together And, um, and, you know, sometimes it takes a little time to figure out what that's going to look like, how it's going to work and being able to assimilate it with everyone. And so I'm very curious to see how that's going to work out. I mean, you know, for an example, I mean, the Browns brought Elijah Moore in very excited about all these things they were going to be able to do with Elijah Moore and, you know, wide back is is a little bit much 
But, um, but you know, they were going to run him out of the backfield and stuff like that a little bit more than they ultimately ended up doing. Because when you actually got it out there on the grass, it didn't exactly work the way that you hoped it would. And so I think there is going to be a learning curve here. I think when you bring in all these elements, when Tommy Reese brings in elements of what he did as a quarterback and what he coached as an offensive coordinator at Alabama in the college game, and when you bring in what Ken Dorsey did with Cam Newton and with Josh Allen, and when you bring in what Deuce Staley and everybody else has done, Andy Dickerson, uh, when you bring in all these thoughts and ideas and you collate and synthesize them, it might take a little while to get it to look the way that you want it to look out on the grass. And so I'm very curious about that because time is not on their side. They don't have time. This can't be a learning curve year. This has to be go time. This has to be go time. This has to be Joe Flacco stepping in with six games left in the season and going you know, four and one in the five games he started. This has to be hit the ground running in week one in Brazil, probably, right? And then on the road, very likely somewhere else. After, after like we said in our, in our bingo pod, after a week in Jacksonville. After a week in Jacksonville, <laughs> that's right. So, um, or maybe they'll just go right from Brazil to, uh, to London. How about that? Let's just go right from Brazil to London and just like spend the week in London. Or, or Brazil then, to Las Vegas and we just, none of us will survive. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, it you know, it just might not look like a well-oiled machine in week one, especially, uh, you know, when you're, you're flying potentially, you know, 13, 14 hours to your destination and getting adjusted to everything in a different country and whatnot. Again, this team travels well, but you really do want to hit the ground running. Deshaun Watson doesn't have a lot of time to spend on the learning curve. It, it's got to, it's, it's got to come together quickly. Yeah. And, and you know, for all of that, that I said about the contract, Ashley, it is still like, Hey, we're going into year three of this. Like, you do need to start getting some real answers about Deshaun Watson. Like, what is he going to be long-term? Was that second half against Baltimore, you know, was that really, hey, Deshaun's back and then he just got hurt? Was that an anomaly? Like, we just, we need to start getting answers about what he's going to be as a Cleveland Brown because we've only seen 12 games of him. Yeah, and I think it's this idea, too, that when they went out to get Deshaun Watson, they've talked about it this way, you know, basically since he walked in the building, This isn't like a five-year plan, right? They don't want to look at him like that. This is like 10 years, they're hoping. You know, when you find the guy, you're hoping he's here for about a decade. So I think that's part of it because we are, yes, it is year three. And that sample size is small right now. So you need to know, like, and hopefully get that idea or that confirmation in their case of, yes, this is the guy that, you know, we want a second long contract with him, that he's the guy we thought he is. So I think that's also a big part of the reason for needing those answers is because like time moves so quickly, like pretty soon you are going to have to make that decision on, Hey, we want you around exponentially longer than that initial five years. Um, And I just think, yeah, right now that sample size is, is so tiny and yeah, it's tantalizing. The last thing you saw of him is that second half in Baltimore, which as we said on our bingo board pod, I'm sure We're going to hear plenty about that in these spring and early summer months from the Browns. I'm sure that's a narrative they're going to want to keep pushing because, yeah, ideally you want that guy that went 14 for 14 in the fourth quarter and led that comeback in, you know, against the best team in the division or whatever. So, yeah, you need to see more of it. And it's not just about the next three years of this deal. Okay, let's take a break and let's talk a little Nick Chubb uh, when we come back. All right, back on the Orange and Brown Talk podcast, we're talking a little bit about silly season here in the NFL. And I'm actually wondering, Mary Kay, is it good for the Browns that now there's some stuff floating out there for whatever reason that Nick Chubb could be a cap casualty? Because on two levels, one, it kind of gives them a chance just to see how people respond, right? Just in case. But the other part of it is they get a little leverage, 
because uh, they, you know they need to redo this deal somehow. They can't keep Nick Chubb around on this deal. But on the other hand, Nick Chubb and his folks might be saying, "Okay, go ahead. We dare you to cut us." Not that I think that's act- that would actually happen. I think they'll come together on some agreement. But I don't know. Is could it actually be beneficial to the Browns that that some of this stuff is getting floated out there? You know, I, I see what you're saying, and you could make a case for some of that. But I think in the long run, it feels um, it feels a little dark to me and a little bit negative for uh, for the fan base and for people out there in the world and on social media to think the Browns would be so cold hearted as to cut Nick Chubb. Right? I mean, that is like. It, it's it's like doing something, it's like punching Santa Claus right in the nose when he comes down the chimney. I mean, you, you just, you, like, you're just not going to do this. Um, so I feel like it's, it's not, I'm not seeing the benefit of it. So in terms of the Browns trying to float this out there, I certainly don't think that that's the case. Uh, I, I think this is just people looking at the money, and in some cases, maybe not really taking to heart what Andrew Barry told us point blank on January 22nd at his wrap up press conference, where he said, we're going to do everything we can to get this right and to make this right. Now, that might not be that easy to do because we know Nick is a principled player. And we talked about this yesterday. We know that because uh, he told us that when we were at the Greenbrier last year. And, you know, he has feelings about how running backs should be paid. But things have changed dramatically since then. And he doesn't have that kind of leverage right now. He's coming off of a very serious knee injury and he's doing great. But nobody really knows for sure just exactly how this is going to play out. And not only is he coming off a revision or a reconstruction of a previous horrible knee injury in the same knee, but he's now also, you know, that much older. And so, you know, he doesn't really have the leverage to say, no, too bad. You know, I, I'm, you know, I'm not taking what you're offering. Um, by the same token, I don't think they're going to lowball. It's Nick Chubb. You know, it, it's Nick Chubb. You, you're going to overpay or over incentivize for Nick Chubb. You're going to do that because of who he is and what he represents to this town, this team, and this organization. This is something I'm actually very curious about next week when we talk to these guys. Um, And as we know, we're going to have two separate sessions with Andrew, and he's not going to answer any questions. But I, I am genuinely curious, like when Nick Chubb comes up, sort of how he addresses it in light of um, in light of all this speculation out there about him being a cap casualty, because he was about as firm, I guess, as Andrew normally is in his desire to keep Nick Chubb. He didn't exactly slam the door on the idea that maybe things couldn't work out. I think there's always that possibility that like you could just sit down and maybe for whatever reason it doesn't work out. I would never say 100% he'll be a Cleveland Brown next season. I still feel good that they'll get something done, but I'm curious if he comes out strongly, even stronger next week and is like, no, we're, Nick Chubb is going to be a Cleveland Brown. Or if he still kind of leaves the door open a little bit, even unintentionally, for a move that no one wants to make. But this is the NFL. This is business. Sometimes these things happen. This is kind of on the top of my list, Ashley, to see how Andrew and Kevin address this. Well, I'm just sitting here thinking I had added this to my bingo board in some capacity yesterday because I can tell you what Andrew's going to say, and it's going to be something along the lines of, I won't discuss a singular player's contract. He will not discuss the details of contracts or potential contracts. He's going to say something like that. So, yeah, I mean, maybe like you're saying, Dan, maybe it like unintentionally leaves the door open, but I'm so with Mary Kay on this. I thought since the moment Andrew talked, he was so like adamant and as adamant as Andrew is going to be. And this is where that institutional knowledge that we've talked about comes in handy because I do think they know that they can't afford to do that. It's also just not how they've operated. I do think from how we've seen Andrew Barry work, and what we know about him. I think they really value 
doing right by players. And I think they value what that does for their reputation across the league. The prime example of that to me is Odell Beckham Jr. When that whole thing went down, they had every right to either not trade him or send him to Siberia. They worked with him. He went to LA. He won a Super Bowl. Like they are the team that does those kind of things. So in that vein, I would just be like shocked right now if this like went sideways. I guess it could in the sense that never say never, but that's like the most I'm willing to give it right now. Yeah, I mean, I would just never rule anything out in the NFL. Like, just never. But that said, along those lines, Mary Kay, like Nick Chubb, this isn't even just a fan thing to me. We were all in Pittsburgh. We all, like, saw how this team responded to that injury. Um, I mean, it was... I, I've i been in some bad losing locker rooms. That locker room was worse than after the playoff loss. I like I thought and like it wasn't it wasn't fun after the playoff loss. But I thought that locker room in Pittsburgh after the Chubb injury was like, I don't know if I've been in a locker room that down or that sad. And we saw guys guys were showing up in Nick Chubb college jerseys and wearing Nick Chubb shirts. I've never seen or heard players talk about another player like they do Nick Chubb. And I do think if this team just made a cold he's like the one guy. I don't even think there's another guy in you know, maybe maybe Joel, because he's been around for so long. Maybe if they made some cold business decision decision and sent Nick Chubb packing, I'm not even talking about the fans. I think the ripple effect in the locker room would just be like, what what are we doing here? We can't do this to Nick Chubb. Absolutely. You're so right about that. And all you have to do is look at a couple of things from last year that confirm exactly what you're saying. Number one, they dedicated their entire season to Nick Chubb. Now, other guys went down with injuries. They didn't dedicate their season to those guys. They didn't dedicate it or even co-dedicate it to those guys. They didn't dedicate it to Jack Conklin. Uh, They dedicated it to Nick Chubb. And when Deshaun Watson went down, uh, they were adamant that, no, we are not co-dedicating Deshaun and Nick. This is Nick's season. We are winning this for Nick. So that was number one. And then uh, when you look at that Jets game, which I will always remember that night as being incredibly special, the Browns did a phenomenal job of making that night magical and larger than life. It was like being at a Disney parade. It really was. I mean, it was huge. And, uh, and so uh To have Nick come out in that game beforehand in the Batman mask of all things and smash that guitar and get that team fired up and set that tone. I mean, that tells you all you need to know. That's what he means to his teammates. That's what he means to the organization. And that's what he means to the fans. The fan base, the fan base loves their Nick Chubb like those players do. I mean, you could probably go out and take a poll and ask Browns fans everywhere who their favorite player is. You're going to get plenty of Nick Chubbs, plenty of Nick Chubbs. Uh, so, you know, I, I just think that um, the millions that you could save by trying to do something that wouldn't make Nick happy will not be worth it in any way, shape or form. And, If you're going to spend $230 million guaranteed on Deshaun Watson, certainly, certainly you can find a way to work something out where Nick Chubb ends up happy in this situation. It's got got to be available to you in some way. Yeah, it's it's just hard for me. I, I don't know. Obviously, the players aren't around right now. Um, so, you know, you can get away with some things and, you know, you're not going to have a locker room just full of guys complaining about it. But I mean, Ashley, I'm curious if you agree, cause like, you know, you and I go right in after those games. I don't know that I've been in a locker room as sad as that Pittsburgh locker room. And again, that includes you were in that Houston locker room too, after the wild card game, which was, which was kind of a bummer, but I still would include that game. I don't know that that one was, that was tough. I Yeah, I mean, I think, like, we've been in locker rooms, too, after other guys yeah. suffered significant injuries. And, like, I always use Joel Batonio's kind of, like, the barometer, right? Because no matter 
how bad a loss is. Or even when Joel was dealing with his own injury, he talked to a bunch of reporters when his back was like actively spasming, which don't know how he managed to do that. Just a credit to Joel D'Antonio again, why he is perpetually the good guy award winner. uh, Just one of the reasons, but even like Joel seemed rattled after that game in a way that I've never seen Joel like that visibly upset. I asked him a question. He like took a second to kind of gather himself Like, you don't see him lose composure or come close to it or hear guys talk about it or just feel the energy in a room totally deflated. Like, no matter what this team has gone through in the last three years, I've never felt something comparable. So I do 100% agree. Like, there is just something about Nick. It goes beyond being such a good player. It's like a guy who has woven himself into the fabric of a team in a way that a lot of players never managed to do throughout their careers. And, you know, the other thing to consider here is um, that even, you know, when when you are just talking about on the field performance, I think this is another reason why it did hit these guys so hard, because there are certain running backs that do transcend that position in and of itself. There's the Derrick Henrys, right? I mean, if you take Derrick Henry out of that lineup, they're not the same football team. And I think there was a sense of that happening uh, where, uh uh-oh, it's week two. And where do we go from here? It's it felt like it it had a finality to it. It had a uh, sky is falling feeling to it. It really did. Um, so, you know, I I think that has a lot to do with it too. That you know he's he's just different. He's different, and you know he has been a major reason when they have had success that they've had it. Yeah. By the way, that's the other part of this. Like. Obviously, this is going to be difficult for him to come back from and be the same player. But like Nick Chubb is still a good player. And I think even 80% Nick Chubb or 75% Nick Chubb is still going to be a really good player. And if for for whatever reason, he's able to come back 100%, he's one of the best running backs in football again. So it's not even just an an off field thing. It's like, hey, this guy should have won the rushing title in 2019. He's been one of the best backs in football ever since he stepped on the field. Um, I'll, like, I'll never forget that Raiders game when he carried it three times for like 180 yards or whatever. And then for whatever reason, they kept him on the bench the next two weeks. But he's he's still he can be still be one of the best running backs in football. So there's the on-field element of it too. If you can have Nick Chubb, you want to have Nick Chubb. And you're, I think you're willing to take that chance that he can become that player again. Okay, there we go. Um, we're going to come back with a Hey Mary Kay podcast on Thursday. Lance Reisland is going to get us set up for the Combine on Friday to give us some players to watch and some players he's keeping an eye on in the draft, kind of who could end up in the Browns range. So subscribe to the Orange and Brown Talk podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, find us on YouTube, search Cleveland Browns on cleveland.com and on Instagram, search Orange and Brown Talk. And of course, become a football insider subscriber at cleveland.com slash Browns, the blue banner at the top of the page. For Mary Kay and Ashley, I'm Dan. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks.